round matchup, I am Regina joined, uh, joining Kimo, Len, and Aaron Cybertron Zang. Uh, so, fun, uh, fun seven rounds, guys. I had uh, a great time. <laughs> I, we could I, tell. I really enjoyed all seven rounds. I enjoyed all six rounds. <laughs> 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 um, so, obviously, you guys mentioned rain earlier today. Saw a lot of rain. Uh, yeah. Not every round, but for a good fair amount of it. Uh, different teams than I'd expected from it, though. But would you guess? How'd you guys feel about it? Well, actually, you know, having played, I saw like, like there's like no meta game. I feel like I just went <laughs> against like so many different things. Sometimes that happens when you start out too. That that is true. <laughs> but but <laughs> that being said, I think the teams I faced were actually quite competitive. Like everyone, there were some pretty cool things that I saw. Um, yeah. I mean, <laughs> like like. <what? laughs> it, it, no, but in all seriousness, I think. Um, Why'd you get so sassy? Well, it, <laughs> my point is, I think. The last couple of tournaments have been really interesting because normally it feels like they're like very clear trends. And I guess like Gengar, Como, and Rain stuff have been like those trends. But even looking at like the top tables today, it seems like a lot of people are just using what they want and it's working mm -hmm. out really which well. Is, yeah, which is kind of fun because it, it, I think it adds for some really interesting matches. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you called like for the Braviary stuff and then yeah. seeing that Alola Ninetales come back again or um, the Nihiligo was just like, oh, I was not expecting throwbacks like this on stream. Mm -hmm. A lot of stuff we talked about didn't actually end up doing very well, though. I think, did we see Rain win on stream? We saw Rain on stream, but I think it lost everyone I saw. Same for Gengar. How many Gengar was on once, right? Yeah. Okay. I think th I that doesn't was for sure there was a couple of the rain ones we saw that definitely did not win. But most of the winning teams we saw were kind of out there. Lots of variety, lots of different things. <gasps> Naganadal. <laughs> yeah. I, I think the thing with rain, especially having played it, is that like it's so fast paced, like Carson's team, for example, where like how you play Ludicolo specifically if you're using Ludicolo is just so important and then like each turn matters so much like if you mispredict one turn or if your opponent outplays you one turn like you can lose so much momentum it's so it's just super punishing yeah like i you know i brought the team to the tournament because obviously i succeeded but i think like if you had you need more practice with that team because it's pretty tough to just pick up immediately i found that like 45 seconds wasn't enough for me to make some of my decisions because i couldn't think of all the options quickly enough so I think, uh, yeah, it's a, that's also a testament to Carson winning last weekend. I think, honestly, it's, it's a really difficult team to use uh, in the sense that, like, you either win very quickly or lose very quickly, I feel like, for a lot of games. Yeah, I felt that way playing Rain going back to the last format. Ever since the Water EMZ became, like, the key piece yeah. of Rain teams, that decision of where you target that Water EMZ is so crucial. It can be game deciding in, mm -hmm. in a lot of games, and so it can be really difficult to, to weigh all the options, weigh what your opponent's going to be thinking about where that may be targeted. Uh, whether it's going to protect this turn, you just wait a turn and use it the next turn. It uh, means there's a lot of kind of unpredictability in the way you play. Yeah, there's a lot of mind games too in the sense that like if you're using a Pokemon like Ludicolo, or Ludicolo speci specifically, right? Like you always have like the fake out play turn one. So it's like, do you fake out the partner expecting whoever you would want a Hydro Vortex to protect? Because if you call that correctly, then the next turn you have such a free slot to uh, helping hand Hydro Vortex and potentially just get a quick knockout instantly. But if you don't call it correctly, then it sets you back behind so much. So I found that playing with the team, like, that was definitely pretty tricky to go with, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's, the, I think r there's a reason why Rain is a really strong archetype, but why we haven't seen it do, like, super well for the most of the season, but Carson managed to find a way that worked really well for him, and, uh, all the techs came together, the metagame came together at the right time for him. I or the lack thereof. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, like, an interesting point is, you know, we were expecting Rain to be a really big deal, and I think if other people were expecting that, the lack of weather pivots for that too. The only other weather that I saw today was the hail team that we'd seen in an earlier round, and that was about it. Like I was expecting maybe at least a little bit more counter teaming for that. We did see a Tyranitar, but you know did not. Did we? Wait. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tyranitar was used by uh, was that round Matthew Greaves. One? Yeah, oh, round, yeah round one, way back at the beginning of the day. Oh, um, Titar is such a pickle sword Pokemon. <laughs> <laughs> I. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I saw a couple Charizards on rosters. Yeah. I don't actually remember seeing. I think I actually saw every weather today. Yeah. I yeah. Oh, wait, Nine no, tails. Right. We, did, we did see the Charizard. Politoed, Charizard Y, Titar. Pelipper and Politoed. Oh, I didn't see Pelipper. I, I think so. Then the other question is now that you know this regional is almost wrapping up, and like Aaron had mentioned, there's not really that much of a clear team. Like, where do you guys think then is going to happen? Like, we've got a couple more regionals coming up, and then Nats happening, Internats happening in July. Like, where do you guys think? in this kind of like disarray like do you think it'll stabilize or are we still going to be in a everybody plays whatever th whatever they want you know i still believe in gardevoir we saw it dominate oh. in oregon um kind of take a step back i don't think it'd be 
best Gardevoir set, the best uh, six Pokemon to run with Gardevoir has kind of been st stumbled upon yet. Mm -hmm. I think at some point a, a really dominant Gardevoir team will show up just because it has so many good matchups uh, ac across so many common Pokemon. Uh, but then also because the Megas seem much more balanced than in other years past, I think it's going to be hard for any one team to dominate because you know, if Gardevoir becomes good, then Gengar is such a good answer to it. And you can just keep going A to B beyond that. Yeah, I think, uh, especially when it comes to, like, thinking of worlds, I mean, 2015 was the year where it was like, oh, people are using Charizard, Salamence, and then, uh, obviously, like, Kangaskhan just ends up dominating worlds. But it feels like this year, like, even looking at other international metagames, it's not like they're... In fact, if you look at international metagames, you see some really wacky stuff that's really cool. Like, Mega Aerodactyl was used yeah. in like, a Taiwanese tournament, so... Um, yeah, I, I don't think I, I'd expect to see, like, one Mega, like one mentioned, dominate. And I think that's what makes this format a little bit more exciting, too. It feels like, really, there's so many Megas that are viable if you just build properly around it. But for me, I think, like, Como is still a really interesting Pokemon that I don't think has been fully optimized. Like, we've seen a lot of great players use it. We've seen it make it to the top cut of Internets. But I think there's still so many different ways you can play around with that team. And I think uh, that's one thing I, I'm personally curious about because I think it's really strong. I still like the old Metagross, Lele Amoonga stuff. I think that's still very good. It's mm -hmm. so hard to break. It has a lot of, I think it punishes Gardevoir setups very well. I think it can punish the Komo'o setups very well. Um, I guess Rain is a little harder to do, but I th again, Rain just being so high risk, high reward kind of is its own deterrent. Yeah, Not I mean, you sorry know, to cut you off there. No, <laughs> go for it. I was going to say, I, I think there's a reason why we don't see Rain winning worlds for the most part, right? Like yeah, it, definitely. In fact, it's like, there was, like, a fun statistic where it was, like, Sunny Day was, or, like, Sun in general was typically on, like, almost every world's winning team between, like, 2012 uh, and all the years afterwards, uh, which was an interesting one. Like, you either had I Manual Sun, sense. 2012 was Manual Sun, 2013 was Manual Sun, 2014 was Charizard, 2015 was Manual Sun. Um, and part of it is just, like you mentioned, with Rain, typically the team's Rain is on is either really fast-paced or you have, like, the Rain Trick Room teams where yeah. there are two, like, very distinct modes to play with the team. We've seen Rain Trick Room, like... There's one team on ladder that's really common with like Incineroar, Gatatel, Mawile, Polytoad, oh, Ludicolo, yeah. 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 Bulu. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like it's always really tough for Rain to make it all the way, um, mainly because of the amount of reads that you need to make right like every yeah. step of the way. I think there are also just too many Pokemon that are strong answers yeah. to Rain on their own. Yeah. You know, two of the matches we saw for Rain on stream today ran up against Gastrodon, just couldn't handle it and mm -hmm. lost. And then ran up against, the, we saw the Seismitoad and Politoed run up against an Amoongus that it just couldn't handle right. and lost. Right. And it can be difficult for a team that can have those matchups that you just kind of fold to, to, to really dominate it. Yeah. I mean, you saw some way. other annoying stuff too that wasn't in the rain matchups. Like Mega Venusaur is another Pokemon that's very mm. annoying for a lot of rain teams to play. So there are some answers to it, like Pelipper or Mega Caesar, like not caring that it exists. But it, like against the stereotypical, like, oh, it's Ludicolo or even like, Weird, it's seismic. <laughs> it doesn't really <laughs> care too much. I think like it's cool though, because you guys have mentioned a couple things where it's like we're in this kind of spot. I think where people are kind of choosing now. They're like, yeah, you know, this is kind of where the metagame is at, and that's to say it's kind of nowhere at the same time. So you have this kind of option. Really of deep. Like it's it's kind of <laughs> it's just kind of fun to be like, I'm gonna run this team and see what happens. And I think it's kind of showing like this really diverse pool of Pokemon that we can see. Like seeing that Seismitoad today was like, all right, that was definitely super random Pokemon. Did not expect to see it and. I think it's been kind of <laughs> again. I definitely didn't expect like, to see it again. <laughs> but like, I think it's been kind of cool, like, because now you have all these players who are pushing to use Pokemon that you know people wouldn't really think. And um, I mean, I'm personally still the fan that I think that Gengar and Sinor and Tapu Bulu core has oh been yeah. like really hard. Like it, it's. I think it's been one of the most consistent ones, especially after people found a niche for it. And like, you know, with Tapu Bulu having been uh, at the bottom of that Tapu list last year and kind of climbing its way to like an equal footing with all the other Tapus in a sense. And I liked him in 2017. Let's bring I that up right now. I think you were right a <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, I My think. My guy was getting too much hate. I liked him. I like him. <laughs> <laughs> But I think well, we're waiting on um, uh, just this round to yeah. finish up. I and, mean, uh, let's talk smart money and start like this. So <laughs> you were uh, two people smart money. And Regina didn't even make I a didn't guess. Even that's just, that's I didn't that's just smart money. Six percent of the smart money at this table. I was the smart person. Which is didn't just smart money. poor decision making. Well, I agree. That's why I didn't choose you. But that's oh. a lot of self confidence, Aaron. You're saying that choosing you as the smart money is a poor decision on my part? Yeah, I think you, <laughs> should, you, you should pick me if you have a reason to pick me. You know, I think they had a smart. You know, you guys did choose Rain, and you were using Rain, and Rain is a I think was a smart team choice. Uh, obviously, my team choice for Mega Blaziken did not pan out, and I'm very <laughs> upset about that. There was like one Mega Gang. 
Wait, did you play Mega Gengar today? <laughs> I did not. Oh, what? Where is he at? Okay. Well, but uh, rain definitely was a was a thing. So you were at least you guys had half of it, right? With with Aaron and the and the rain. But I also think it's um like anytime something as specific as rain does well, like people anyone who watched Sao Paulo last weekend, like they're like, oh, rain won. Like I've got to at least have some answers to oh, it. So no something like. Winning a major honestly probably causes a fair amount of people to actually consider the archetype a lot more yeah, than totally. they would otherwise. So I think like if if I actually had like time to consider, you know, what team I would use, I'd want to use something that would like counter the teams that did really well last weekend. Yeah. So Rain was the big one, but I think like Como and Mega Gengar stuff in general as well. And uh, honestly, it looks like a lot of the top teams just weren't like what we saw last weekend at all. No. Which is no. why I think Top Cut's actually gonna be pretty exciting because we saw a lot of wacky stuff. Um, yeah. Like up there. That yeah, always makes it fun. It's a really good point. I'd love to see like a analytics trends since like 2012 gastron usage in the month right, following right, every right, 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 yeah, exactly. just spike every single time <laughs> right, right right um yeah, but one of the interesting things i was thinking about earlier too was like uh regina pointed out like looking forward for internets and worlds like open decks formats always really interesting because like just looking at historical world championship wins like when you think of like t you know the big open decks formats like 2012 and 2015 where ray and shoma won like it, it didn't feel like they had teams that were like, oh, like one step ahead of everyone else. It just seemed like they no. figured out what the best Pokemon were and they just played it better than anyone yeah. else. Whereas like when I look at other teams like Ray's team in 2011, Sajun's team in 2014, and Wolf's team in 2016, those teams felt like they were just one step ahead of everyone in the in, in the team building sense, right? Like not only were the players extremely good, but their teams gave them such a big edge. Uh, whereas like I think in 2012 and 2015, it were just like really solid teams piloted by the best players. Yeah. And so... Open, I think like open decks formats typically are harder. Like, there there isn't as clear cut, as, I guess, of like a solution or breaking the format as there is, and that's why we've seen the meta game like move around so much. But it doesn't feel like it's stabilized because it feels like they're just trends that pop up all the time. Well, and there's just so many options in these yeah. formats. If you look at those more for limited formats like 2011, it was like a contained mm -hmm. set of Pokemon that were always going to be good no matter right. what the trend. So you could answer that set of Pokemon. Whereas you look at like 2015 and this year has made it even uh, worse, where you just have so, so many viable Pokemon <laughs> that you can't answer all of them in one team ever. Well, I think th I think a lot of players would kind of find that an open deck format is really stressful for them. Like, I know a couple people that I talked to are like, stressful. you know, having to think of the fact that there is no concrete team that's dominating anything. It's really hard to kind of build around that. But I also think it, it allows, again, you know, for you to think like, hey, this Pokemon could work. And I mean, even looking at the international things, like, you know, having the Nido King, the Low Punny, and like Serena uh, back in like the Oceana ones, and then kind of the Mega Scizor from last week, it's just, I think it just kind of opens up this chance for other Pokemon that you that you can use it's sort of like in a hidden way where it's like, I can bring this and nobody will know what to expect and I can use that to my advantage. And then once you, lo once you lose that advantage, you just go on to the next thing that you want to kind of try to figure out. Like, like yeah, that's pretty fair. I mean, I'm gonna use that to shift right to no one prepared for line in today. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's oh, an action. man. I hope he cuts. Please, <laughs> dude, my smart money is the strongest one. That's a good point, though, right? Because with open decks formats, like you said, like it's actually impossible, literally impossible to prepare for everything. Oh, and totally. so, um, I actually think in 2015, people really didn't use Azumarill. Like Azumarill, I think if someone built a really good team around him, played oh, well, would have won Worlds in 2015. I agree. Um, and I think like there was maybe one or two players in the top 32 with it, um, and like I feel like they had maybe figured it out, but maybe they didn't get the matchups that they needed uh, because yeah. uh, like maybe they didn't play as much chalk. Like I remember I actually built a team that countered chalk really hard that year, but then I played like zero chalk teams, which oh. was. But you know that's just the nature of like if you're you're trying to counter like the most common teams, then you're you're probably foregoing your matchups against like the less common things, and then you that can really bite you. Uh, so. Yeah, like something like Linoon is like, okay, no, I, don't, I feel like most people aren't going to think about it when they're team building. No okay. But then you stare against it in team preview and you're just like, wow, like now what do I do? <laughs> yeah. So a lot of it, like, I mean, a mark of a good player is being able to adapt, like, as they see and being able to learn through the set. But yeah, it, it, like it's, I mean, and then like you got things like Chansey too, right? Most people just oh. assume no one's going to use it. I don't think we've seen anyone use it for a while, but. It's for you know, good reason. That's yeah. always, that's always something like that's the most frustrating thing where it's like round one, you go up against someone who's using something like Chansey or Eevee, like very specific strats that are pretty easily countered if you have a tech move, but otherwise it yeah. might just run over you. Yeah. A tech but move that's you know, one of your 24 exactly. moves. Right. And yeah. right. When you're trying to answer so many other things in the format, very easy to just drop. I mean that's so hard too, especially when you have when you only have four choices for each Pokemon's move. You're like, what is my biggest matchup? But then, like you said, you'll run into something that you're just like, I didn't prepare for this, and I don't know what to do now. And I think that's kind of one of the fun things about kind of you know talking to people and getting ideas from other people because you know you can run the same Pokemon as everybody else, but you can have completely different strategies regarding yeah. it and be like, got you. <laughs>
I mean, yeah, like, Kamo'o usually goes for, you know, the soul blaze, but today we saw it go for a, a different kind of beat, you know? It's playing its own drum. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned Kamo'o as a Pokemon you don't think has really been fully exploited yet. Do you think the, the belly drum Kamo'o is worth looking at? I didn't see that, but I didn't know that was... Uh, yeah, we saw that on stream. What one. move... Did it use any other moves besides belly drum? No, it just used belly drum and then And then it got knocked out? Oof. Yeah. Well, it then there's a secret. It'll oh, take okay. with it. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, yeah, I think, like, there was, uh, you know, like, uh, Desu was in top eight, uh, and he had a Komo team, and uh, I thought that was a really interesting take on it. I think uh, Arash was using, like, the same six uh, tournaments before as well. So that one had, like, Zerkadri, Tapu Bulu, Clef, uh, Incineroar, yeah. and Mega Gengar. And uh, I, I think, you know, with the, the thing that's really tough about Komo is, like, even if you have protection, like, it's just so weak to fairy. Even yeah. if it sets up, it can get dunked on, and so... I, it, that's one of the things where it kind of struggles in the sense that, like, I think you have to play very properly around, you know, f the fairy types that you might see, especially with all the tapus being common. But, yeah, I don't know. I just feel like there's still a lot of ways to potentially open up that archetype specifically just because I, I feel like it's uh, kind of underexplored in the sense that a lot of the teams I've seen with it are kind of the same Pokemon, more or less, just alternations between here and there. I'm wondering if, like, someone can take, have, like, a completely new take on it. Let's not belly drum. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I agree. I think that archetype has tons of potential. I think it's super strong, and that's why I chose it as, like, the archetype smart money today and why I'm disappointed that I have not personally seen it <laughs> on stream. It, it, to me, it just makes sense that I would have saw it, especially because it's unexplored, and you're in this point in the format mm -hmm. where it's like, well, I think I can get free matchups just because people aren't thinking about this enough. And instead, you see uh, Line Moon. Yeah, um, and I think, too, though, like, when you when you talk about Pokemon that have very obvious weaknesses like Como O against all these fairies, people still bring Pokemon like that, like that low funny that we saw today, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in the face of an acrobatic Celesteel that was like, I'm gonna do it anyway, I'm gonna mega evolve, like, let's just do it. And I think it's so cool seeing people just look at these weaknesses that Pokemon have to other Pokemon that are dominant in the format and being like, Nope, I'm gonna make it work and it's gonna turn out really well. Like Como O I think really has that chance because if you support it really well, like it has the potential to just really wreak havoc yeah. on um, other mods. I mean, you know, I never, I never thought I would see a devastating Drake in the, the format where fairies are running around everywhere. But lo and behold, like, saw that a couple times, and it's just, it's been kind of, it's been kind of crazy. Like, uh, as like my first format, seeing it from start to, to where it is right now, it's right. been kind of wild seeing it evolve and just being yeah. like, oh, look at all these Pokemon I never thought would get any sort of like like any day like Gardevoir especially having seeing it come back up in usage and then kind of go down so fast like two months after that spike it's it's been it's been a wild run I think for this for, for this uh for this meta no, yeah, but actually uh yeah. yeah go ahead <laughs> Kimo, go ahead yeah I will <laughs> what were you saying uh, no anyway so I think that's like a really interesting point because being uh, looking back on a format is especially if you didn't play in it is really different from like watching it change like if you look at 2015 you're gonna go like Oh, Kangaskhan in all top eight worlds? Okay, that's the format. <laughs> but, like, that wasn't the entirety of the format at all. And you saw, like, a lot of Charizard dominance early on. Uh, my man Alberto Lara won two regionals with War had Mega Charizard Salamence. Gardevoir had its era in that format also. Yeah, it did. I was going to comment specifically at Nationals that year. That was, like, where Gardevoir had its big showing. Yeah. And winning and getting, like, both the you know, finalist spots were there. And there were very few Kangaskhans, actually, I can even think of that was in that top eight. Like, it was mainly Gardevoir. Um bunch of Salamences as well. I think Wolf was one of the only Kangaskhan users in that top eight that year. Uh, I remember Blake had Charizard, Angel had Charizard. Uh, so yeah, it, you know, that year was it was like Gardevoir has you know, one huge showing and then when it comes to Worlds, it's, it ends up being Kangaskhan. I mean, it was, there was one Gardevoir in top eight actually. That was the only <laughs> other Mega represented. Well, think about this, Aaron. Have you ever listened to a song and thought like, man, the song is really cool? Of course. Have you ever listened to a song um, <laughs> 300 times after that and thought it wasn't as cool anymore? Sure. I love Char. It's the same thing with Hyper Boys. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not as cool. It's not as effective. It doesn't catch you in the same way. Especially if you've got soundproof going for you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's a big deal, honestly. Like, uh, oh, I, it's I'd be, crazy. I'd be really interested to see how it would shake up if, like, Soundproof weren't on Como and, like, how bad. How do they think Como would be it's here so at all? No, I think it would like still work. Como is interesting because it acts as its own deterrent because the more popular <laughs> it is, the less effective it is, even beyond, like, how that usually works where people are just like, oh, I'm going to counter that. Because then when you have the Como O mirror, you just kind of sit there and, like, wonder what's going to happen. It's, like, a very awkward mirror match. Or one player has a, a non-sound dragon move. 
<laughs> oh, they're gonna start busting that one out. The, the old clanging scales, dragon pulse, come on. Oh, yeah. Gosh. Watch I mean, out. <laughs> I mean, we joke about this now, but honestly, but I could see that. Yeah. Wins yeah. Worlds, you right, watch right. out. But I was worlds, I was gonna be like, I told you guys, yeah. Como was like, you guys should not have slept on it. Like, this is the mon. I, I think one other fun thing to always look at is it's like it's tough to really judge the results of internets relative to worlds or nats relative to worlds because uh, I think a lot of people go into internets not with the goal to win the tournament, but with the goal to say just get top 32 or 64 or top eight to get whatever championship points they need. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's part of the interesting thing about having this championship point structure relative to what, you know, we used to have years ago. Yeah. Um, and as a result, you know, m I, w I, I, don't, I don't know what the percentages was, and I have no idea, like, what the ballpark is. But, like, a lot of people going to the event, like, especially if you look at the NA standings, like, out of the 80 top players, like, about 40 of them, like, uh, don't have their invite yet. And so they are probably going to try to play something that's a little bit more conservative, like, knows will get them more wins. Um, but then when it comes to Worlds, it feels like that's where, you know, tr people try to pull all the stops. Because if there's anywhere to pull the stops, it is Worlds. worlds yeah. yeah. That's, I think that's when you show, like, hey, uh, this is, this is here are all the teams that I used to get here, but here's the team that I've been wanting to run, mm -hmm. and here's what you can do to stop it. Hopefully yeah. nothing. Um, and I think you're right. Like, that's your time to shine, but to, to do nothing. that. Yeah, hopefully nothing. <laughs> but you have to get there first. And I think that's a good point, like, playing conservatively versus, you know, being super aggressive. And, mm -hmm. uh you know, going back to like that range team where you have to kind of go aggressive because if you don't, then you might be on that backtrack. But I think also like safe plays are kind of hard to make sometimes, especially when you're playing against Pokemon that uh, like kind of counteract that. Like one of the safest things you can do is always switch out your Pokemon and then you've got Shadow Tag in here. And I think, you know, some people will argue that Gothitelle might be a better Shadow Tag user than uh, Gengar just because of that. I think that heal pulse especially makes it super valuable. Well, I think if you were to com actually compare them and like, just like, try to determine which one's better. Gothitelle's real advantage is that you get it turn one, like right out of the gate. Yeah. When you have Gengar, you have to take that turn to Mega Evolve, and they can get out then, and it's kind of harder to create a lock when you don't like what you're locking anymore. So that would be where I would put the most value in Gothitelle, but Gengar does this really cool thing, and it's called, called damage. Oh. <laughs> and it's just great. Mm, I, I wouldn't know anything about this. Oh, okay. <laughs> Goth is a yeah interesting Pokemon to me. I obviously love it, at, having run it at Worlds like in 14 and 15. I think uh, Z moves definitely made its life a lot harder. Oh um, yeah, especially because like, if, for example, in 2014, I think one of the reasons why Goth was just one of the best Pokemon in the format by far, and why there's a reason why it won Worlds and there were so many good performances with it. But there was like pretty much nothing in the format that could actually one shot it. Like you, no. most people would EV their Goth to to survive. Uh oh, we have a delivery. <laughs> tired. He doesn't eat run too often. All right, guys. Yes. So, this top yeah. eight. So, so top eight. You're, yeah, your oh. top eight. What? Oh my gosh. Okay, here what we is go. Going here on? we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Number one. Number one seed. At seven and VI, no, VIP player. Cade Bowles. I don't think I've ever seen a VIP player do that well. Congratulations. 7 0. Yeah, awesome Ooh, stuff. History. Seed number two with five Pokemon Giovanni Costa. What? Oh, that guarantees his world's invite. Uh, I think. Seed number, yeah, oh, yeah, he clinched it yeah. in round five, I think. Yeah, so congratulations yeah. to you for yeah, that world's invite. Yeah, congrats, dude. You deserve it. Can't wait to see you. I, I mean, focus on this first. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, seed number four, we have James Eeks from NorCal. Oh. Love him. I wait, I didn't say C3, no, Jerry didn't Myers? Say C3. <laughs> oh, I because I was definitely <laughs> thinking that I said it. Well, C3 is Jerry Myers. Uh, he is the, uh, everyone up until the sixth seed is X1. Uh, at seed five, we have Matthew, a.k.a. Picklesword Greaves. That belly drum. Uh, belly drum Kamo <laughs> is in top eight. That's really cool. All right. Uh, number six, we have Emilio Estrada, who destroyed Aaron Zhang round one. <laughs> destroyed Aaron Zhang clapped. round one and played a really <laughs> dominant game on stream also. Yes. I was really impressed by his play today. At he seed number seven, me. we have the modern gamer, Joseph Selmer, 5-2. Right. Uh, he was also on stream. I, mo a lot of these players were on stream today. And at the eighth seed, just getting right in, we have Eugene Vizzle, who I believe is a SoCal yes, local. Yes, uh, he also actually lost a Pokemon today. Oh, really? What I heard, yes. Oh, You're my. Kidding me. Um, yeah. And then yeah. just for <laughs> the sake of clarity, my man Alberto Lara clinching in at 16. <laughs> yeah, we also have. Because he needs all those extra champions. Yeah, he <laughs> really, really needed them. We have defending champion Preston Clark at 13th, uh, right. also at 5-2, and two, but not managing to make that top cut. And then a few more players. We saw Alex Faust, Nathaniel Monroe, uh, also ending up in that top 16. Yeah, pretty uh, solid here. I mean, Adrian uh, Siegler did win Portland, I believe, a few weekends back. 
Uh, Riley Factura, who actually hasn't really played at all this season, but he actually has won three regional titles. Yeah. So one of the few players in the country to have you know multiple titles. And so it's cool to see him back because I know he hasn't been playing at all. Um, and he started two and two as well, I believe. So good to see him. Oh, you yeah, know, good for him back. then. Yeah. And Bridger, one of Utah's top players, who we also saw on stream, ended yep. up at 15th, also in that top 16. Yeah, and of course, 9 through 11, we got Alex Faust, uh, who was on stream earlier, yes. I believe, right? Uh, Brian yeah. Chavez at 10th, and Nathaniel Monroe at 11. So that rounds up the top 16. Unfortunately, Justin Davis finishing 5 and 2, but bubbling the out a championship. Only 5 and which, 2 uh, that did not that's get. I, I think his, uh should be changed in the industry. I am with yeah, you yeah, wholeheartedly. Very bad. unfortunate. Um, yeah, because. Basically, the gap between him and Alberto. Alberto gets 80 championship points. Justin gets none. Yeah. And that came That's down pretty to brutal. a couple points on resistance. All right. So, we have we had a smart money earlier. None of us made it. <laughs> you guys made it. Within our, within our top cut here. Oh, no. Who do you guys think is the um, smart money? Uh, I'm going to say Emilio. I was really impressed with the game we saw. I was going to go with the same really way. Really impressed that he was able he to beat Aaron me. so easily. Yeah, not only did he clap Aaron, but I, I, I really do think the Medigar's Lele Amunga score is super, like, strong. And none of the other teams I can think the, of the teams My that I've seen, I don't think any of them actually have a very good matchup. Uh, uh, James got destroyed by Amoongus. Geo, Geo has five Pokemon. Eugene has five Pokemon. <laughs> Geo has five Pokemon, but he does have that Mega Gengar. Could end up he with does. a pretty good yeah. matchup. So that, well, that's cool for me because if Geo still wins, then, then my the other smart money still won. <laughs> yeah, but, but I have to go with Amelia just because I think that that team is very strong. And he's been playing very well. I haven't seen uh, Matthew Brees play, but I think he's a really strong player. I remember I played him in 2015. He made day two of Nationals that year. Uh, and I, I, I think he's definitely one of those players that, like, is waiting for, like, a really big finish. Uh, he might have. I think he probably has some good regional finishes under his belt, but um, I don't think he has a regional title under his name. And he's definitely been around for a while. Um, like, he's, he's got a play style that reminds me a lot of Wolf. He plays yes. very defensively. Yes, absolutely. Always comes up with, like, a new creative way to play defensively. Last year in Utah, we saw... The, uh, well, well, he cut here last year too, I believe. Yeah, and he had the uh, Pinchberry Marowak. That's right. Uh, That's yes. right. It was awesome. It was just right. there for Parish Song and Lightning Rod support, and he didn't need the thick club. Um, those kinds of things that he finds ways to play uh, common Pokemon in unique ways, very defensively. And you know, in this time, it's Como, a common Pokemon, but in a unique way with <laughs> Belly Drum. Uh, not necessarily <laughs> defensively. <laughs> I won't try to call Belly Drum a defensive move, but oh, he's oh. he's the, he's the Como guy. Oh yes, dude, yes. So which is th th that knowing that makes it just extra bizarre for me because you have defensive player, <laughs> pickle sword, <laughs> pinchberry marowak. Like he had like some ridiculous Gyarados set one year, and now he's using belly drum camo. Just there's such a weird disconnect there. Um, one of the I things that's <laughs> interesting too is I cut you off. Here. No, go don't. Ahead. <laughs> you gave me it earlier. You go. What I was gonna say is. Uh, we are playing all of Top Cut today. Which yeah, okay, been that's what I was going to say. Okay, there you that's go, why yeah. I reacted guys, that way. Because I was like, like I was like, man, I can't wait for like James and Matthew to figure out how to play that Shadow Tag game. And pre uh, <laughs> 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 but they won't because uh, yeah. what you're trying to get to is that we're going to start Top Cut here in just a couple yeah, minutes. Yeah. Exactly. And rather than having all night to watch the games we've streamed today, uh, you know, talk to all the people they play test with and figure out what those matchups look yeah. like, what yeah. the best Ooh, lead for them is for that game one. It, it's more yeah, like you the way you have to play right Swiss, in. where you just actually have to look school. at team preview. Maybe you've heard from some of your friends what you, they saw on yeah. their teams today. But the, I mean, Maybe people, ask some people, people online what wrong. they saw on the stream, but it's not, not as controlled an environment yes. as when you're playing Sunday. No, I, it's, I it's super interesting. It's the... Uh, it's an environment that we're almost completely not used to anymore. It used to be the norm. I was going to say, And yeah. now we're just thrown back into this old school. Like, we went from, like, the modern day music to, like, Tupac. You getting me here? <laughs> like, oh this is just a big throwback. Uh, so Low pump to this, Tupac. The idea of, like, adapting on the fly, even in cut, is really interesting. And that's part of why I'm really sticking with Emilio here. Because it's, I think... Of the teams that I've seen, it's the most solid. He has the least hindrance in terms of team sheet errors. <laughs> and th there's just so much going for him, I think. Well, I think the nice thing, too, is that at least, you know, there's a certain mindset you get when you get to Top Cut. It's just like, hey, you're at, like, the top of your game right now. You made it. Yeah. So you just ride that momentum and keep going. Oh, yeah. Instead of, you know, stressing yourself out watching these matches. And Not even just the momentum, but that, like, almost ego feeling. You know what I'm <laughs> yeah. saying? Like, you don't have enough time to go home and be like, I did all right. Like, you're still like, I'm Let's doing do great. <laughs> I, I think that's actually a really big point, though, right? Like, whenever you make top cut of a tournament, more, most of the time, like, you feel like you've been playing really well for, like, the majority of the day. Yeah. And so I think that's actually a little bit more exciting because we're going to see these players at, like, the top of their game at right now you're as right. opposed to, uh, I know, like, 
personally, at my, I myself have like had a day to prepare and then just like ended up falling completely short. And I think that's something that we see a lot of the times. Uh, and so I, I don't know. I, I think it's actually really exciting having like played in regionals way back in the day. Yeah. It's like you play it's nine really rounds cool and then you play throwback. top 16, top eight, top four finals. Oh. You know, that's like 13 <laughs> rounds total. Back to and e even uh, you know back back when we look at like the older days of worlds where you'd play all the way up until the finals yeah. all in one day. So uh, I, I think it's, it's just exciting and. Uh, one of the reasons why I still point to Matthew is I know he has a lot of best of three experience. Anytime yes. you make it to like day two of Nats, like you know you play so many good players in best of three, um, and yeah, I think this type cut's exciting because I don't think anyone here has actually won a regional, so it's no. going to be a first for someone. Yes. Uh, and it definitely is filled with names that I think are waiting for like a really big showing. Yeah, I agree. All right, so just to reiterate a little bit, but I have a reason for this. So we have Cade versus Eugene. Gio versus Joseph, Emilio versus Jerry, and James versus Matthew. Okay. Which match do you think will be the most exciting in top eight? Oh. I can't oh. say because I haven't seen all their teams. So. Uh, yeah, I don't yeah, think Yeah, but if you, yeah, if you I have, like, for, well, first of all, you can just go with bias. Uh, yeah, I mean, not having seen all the teams, so just kind of going off the teams I have seen, I'm really excited for that, uh, that James Matthew yeah. match. Yeah, that was where I was going. But you're telling me, belly drum como. Size of a toe, that's already enough yeah. for me. Like, <laughs> <laughs> really you don't even need to add it. Everything else can be completely <laughs> standard, but I would still <laughs> want to see that one. Um, all right, yeah, but we'll be back with uh, the first of these topic yeah, matches dude. in a little bit. So yeah, stick shout out very soon. You're like, two or three minutes. <laughs> don't wait till tomorrow morning. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Don't, don't even don't leave. Yeah, just, just stay there, guys. You need a water break? Don't get up. <laughs> <laughs> you can get up for a water no, break. No, don't. <laughs> we will see you guys for topic real soon. Stay hydrated, fellas.